So good, good morning. Um, uh, welcome to CWI. The CWI was the first internet connection, open internet connection in Europe, 35 years ago in a few days time. Uh, and we now have the fastest internet connection, internet uh, switch in the world. Uh, the, the, the big building next to us here with uh, a skyscraper with no windows uh, is uh, is the AMSIX uh, exchange currently running at 12 terabits per second uh, and it's got no windows because there are no people in that building only computers uh, uh, taking advantage of the uh, of the low latency um, so I'm going to uh, assume that uh, that uh, you've already uh, uh, installed the software but if you haven't then uh, there's no hurry until the first uh, first um, exercise uh, you only need the server for the exercises. You don't need it to actually follow the tutorial online. But that's the um, that's the URL there for the tutorial, uh, that, so that you can follow uh, follow along. Um, now, I'm I'm assuming since this is an advanced course that you know the what and the why and the wherefore of uh, of uh, of X forms. So I'm not going to give you any of the background. I will just break one piece of news here, which hasn't yet been public and made public. Um, you may know that um, uh, John Chelsom in, in England uh, uh, wrote uh, an X-Forms, uh, a big X-Forms application, probably the biggest X-Forms application there is, and that's uh, a health records system um, distributed so that um, so that you can have you can have it running in uh, different hospitals and they can uh, communicate with each other. It's all running already running in a, a few hospitals in the UK. Um, but the the news is that in the Ukraine they're going to install that nationally uh, as uh, as the health record system for 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 Ukraine. So uh, so it's a, a big uh, a big development uh, news for for X forms and great to see that it's uh, that it's uh, such. Um, uh, it's that has been useful uh, and, and the nice thing is that that is the work of a single person and that demonstrates um also the power of x forms because a single person can make such an important uh, uh, uh application uh, single-handedly okay so this is a brand new tutorial i've never given it before so uh, I'm happy to receive uh, feedback at the end about uh, the things that, that worked for you and the things that didn't work for you. Um, I can guarantee there's way too much material. Uh, uh, that, uh, and, I, and one of the things I'm interested to see is uh, how far we get through it uh, this morning in three hours. Uh, was, we, we, we certainly won't uh, consume it all. Um, but the tutorial is online, obviously. Uh, so uh, so uh, you can ca continue uh, carrying on uh, at home. Um, if I'm hoping that you've done the earlier introductory uh, tutorial, um, there are fewer exercises, but those exercises are a bit longer than the ones in the introduction introductory one where they were deliberately kept very short so that you could do them in about 10 minutes. But again, uh, it would be interesting for me to see uh, how quickly uh, we, you get through the, uh, through the examples. Uh, through the yeah the examples um so uh the um the tutorial is structured in two parts uh a, a lot of techniques just showing you how to do certain things uh and then a whole bunch of examples showing uh showing how those techniques uh, get applied i'm i'm not sure if we'll get uh, to the examples actually we may we may do but uh, in any case as i say they're uh, they're all in the tutorial at the end and so uh um, uh, so that uh, should be okay. Um, of, of the exercises that you have to do, there are example exercises in the back, as it were, so that uh, so that you uh, exam sorry example answers in the back, so that uh, if you don't get well, whether or not you get through it, you can compare it with uh, with how I did uh, uh, did the exercises. Um, so I, I'm now going to start. Are there any questions before I begin? Okay, then let us begin. So um, my first uh, my first example, um, and, and I've collected these over the years, often when people have asked online, how do you do a certain thing? Then I've sort of given an answer and then sort, sort of collected that in a, in a, a directory of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of techniques. Uh, and so uh, the first technique we're going to look at is how to do collapsible sections, something like this, 
that uh, that you click on uh, something and it exposes um, uh, exposes the thing, uh, but that you can click it uh, in and out. And uh, and we'll see this several times in uh, in in later examples. So there are two ways to do it, and there's one where it's built in the language that there are, there's, a, there's, there's actually markup to allow you to do this. And then there's another uh, where you do it data-driven. And personally, I prefer data-driven just because it gives you more power um, uh, that you can, you can open it and close it based on uh, uh, complicated uh, calculations, as it were. Uh, but anyway, this is the simple case and it's used as a switch with two cases, and one case is the closed case, and one case is the open case. Uh, and so they look the same because they both start with the, a trigger, um, and that's the thing that you click on to open it uh, or, or close it. Uh, and then uh, the, the open case here uh, contains the collapsible stuff, the stuff that you want to, uh, want to make visible. So this is, as I say, based, uh, hardwired into the language as it were. Um, so you've got just got two cases here, a closed and, uh, and, and open. And uh, the, the closed one, the toggle, uh, opens the, uh, the closed, uh, the open case, and the open case, the, to the, the trigger toggles the, uh, the, to the, the closed case. Simple uh, and easy. The second one uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, with doing it based on data, and that data is, uh, 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 has a relevance attached to it. So basically you have a group uh, with a, a reference to uh, some value, and the only thing you're interested in in that value is uh, whether it's relevant or not. And so here at the bottom, you can see uh, that uh, I've got an instance uh, with that value show, and I show, and I say that, the, uh, um, that, that value is relevant um, if the if uh, um, uh, if the 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 value of show is true, but I could make that I could make that any anything I wanted. I could say if the value of show has the value of show or or whatever I want to, or if it's not empty, for instance. So you can you can make any any old condition here uh, that makes uh, that value relevant, and then when it becomes re relevant, uh, the collapsible stuff uh, just just becomes uh, visible. So. Um, uh, so in this in this case, uh, um, you've got one trigger, um, and it just changes its uh, label accordingly uh, according to whether the show value is uh, is uh, relevant or not, and then uh, and then uh, um, uh, when you click on that uh, trigger, uh, you just change the value of show uh, from uh, uh, you do a not on it. Uh, so, uh, so you do a, a not on that value, so it goes from true to false. And uh, in fact, uh, that's this version that we're looking at here. Uh, so clicking on this makes uh, show uh, relevant, uh, and then uh, the values get uh, get shown. So we're um, uh, we're on uh, onto our first exercise. Uh, so um, uh, the second uh, value, the second example on the on, on, in this section. Uh, take that, so you right click on the on the, the word source uh, and say save as and uh, save it somewhere. And so you're going to edit that so that instead of using a trigger uh, to to set uh, set uh, the the value of show, I want you to make a, have a boolean value so that you just click uh, you you just click on it uh, using an input. Any questions? So you've got a Boolean value and you attach that to an input that's in the exercise on the tutorial. It's the code for it is actually there, input and whatever. And clicking on that to make that true uh, exposes the hidden data. And clicking it again to make it false hides the hidden data. So instead of using a trigger, you use an input. Yep, go. So um, what, uh, what we're going to see now is, uh, you'll, you'll immediately recognize the technique, the technique from before, um, that uh, you, uh, you click on this and it's a shopping list. So you say, well, I need to buy bread and milk. 
And then when you close it, that it only shows you the things that you've got to buy. And then uh, when you're in the supermarkets, as you buy them, you can click them off and then they disappear. I actually use this all every day. Uh, this is how, uh, how, I, uh, how I do my shopping list. Uh, so this is a, a real life uh, example, except uh, mine is a, a little bit more complicated, but I'm just showing you the techniques for this. So um, if you know X forms, you already know that, there's, that it's possible to hardwire of values like uh, bread uh, and butter into uh, into your your code, and then um, it uh, you, the ones that you select get um, uh, collected in that uh, shopping reference there, uh, which you can output just as a string of all the things you've got to got to buy. Um, but having these values hardwired is not not particularly useful. Much better for it to be uh, um, uh, da data driven. Um, uh, and by the way, if, uh, if, uh, if the instance is already initialized with values like this, here's a string that says butter and bananas, uh, then that select uh, will all, already have those things uh, selected. You'll, you can see that on the screen in the, uh, in the tutorial. Um, but it's, um, it's actually much handier if your data comes comes from data rather than being hardwired into the select because it gives you much more uh, flexibility. So you can either have it in, in an internal instance like this, uh, where you've just, uh, uh, you've just got the, the things that you might want to buy. Um, and uh, in this case, because the name and the value are all the same, I've just kept, uh, just kept, uh, kept the, the name as it were. Uh, or you can store it in a file, uh, a separate file and, and load it from there. That's all basic uh, XForm stuff. Uh, and then your select command uh, uh, control um, is the same, except rather than all those items, uh, you just have an item set which gets uh, the produce values uh, from that instance and then uh, repeatedly uh, loops over that uh, to give you the labels and the values. So again, you can see that, uh, you can see that working um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the tutorial. Uh, now you have two options, uh, uh, although um, uh, the, the basic version, as it were, um, uh, use, uh, produces a string. And I should say that the reason that it does produce a string is because that's what HTML does. And um, when we first designed XForms, we based it on what XForms, uh, on what HTML did, uh, and only later realized actually we were, we were being too much like HTML and we could actually do it much better with XML. Uh, so uh, it's it's better really rather than having a string like that to actually have a structured result like this where you get each element uh, uh, as uh, as as a child of the uh, uh, of of the value that you're setting, and you only need to make one change instead of value ref equals dot you say copy ref equals dot, and then the whole element uh, and attributes and all all content gets uh, gets uh, copied into the result so it's in general for structured data it's uh, it's a much more useful uh, version of select of course this means you now have to change how you output uh, the value uh, but you can just do a repeat over the produce and output each one individually uh, and again that's uh, that's example is um, um, uh, 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 done in the tutorial, you can see it working. But instead of that repeat uh, outputting it, we could just do another select uh, on the things that we've that 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 that, that we've selected, uh, and and put uh, print uh, uh, display that. That's the word I was looking for. Display that as a select of the, and those are the things that you need to buy, and then you can click on them one by one. Uh, 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 to say that you bought it, uh, so you you do you do one set of clicking on the things you need to buy, and then you that gives you a display of the things you need to buy, and then you can click on those one by one as you as you buy them. So this is what it looks like at the moment. So you've got one select there uh, for the all the lists that you might all the objects that you might want to buy. And then the second one is the ones that you've selected that you want to buy that you can click on um, uh, as, you, as you buy them. But now we're going to 
do a sneaky trick. And uh, you can see, whoops, you can see the difference here. So that's what we have, and that's what we're going to change it to. That is to say, the second select, we're going to ha reference exactly the same object. So uh, what is being what what is happening here is that we're displaying the the things that we've selected that we want to buy, um, and we're just displaying that as itself. What that means is that every time we click on one of the things. Uh, that we bought, it disappears because it's also referencing the same place. So here we've got a, li a list of only the things that we're going to we want to buy. And as we click on them, because that's the same source as here, then they just dis disappear from this list. So um, the important thing about this is that it illustrates an essential property of XForms that you might think of an, a select control as populating a data structure, but in fact, it works in both directions because the data structure populates the select as well. So it's two way. And so you can change either side and the other side will, will react. And really this is an essential aspect of understanding how XForms works that many things in XForms are two way and that your control is, is a display as well as an input. Um, it, it's uh, it, it, the two things are talking to each other. Uh, so uh, the 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 rest of uh, of uh, of what I've just uh, talked about it's in the tutorial, but it's basically just turning those two things into an app uh, using the uh, the relevance uh, display uh, thing from the first chapter. So uh, now's the time for another exercise. This one's a simpler one. Take uh, that last uh, example on the page, uh, right click on it, save it into your examples folder, and then add um, uh, 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 hint elements uh, to the triggers um, uh, to, uh, to, to, so that when you hover over it, uh, it tells you what's going to happen, what, what you're looking at. Okay? Go. The, uh, the next technique is open selections. Um, uh, and the sort of thing that I'm going to do is, so you've got something like this, but now you want to add an item uh, to the list. So for instance, I might want to add eggs to the list uh, and then it, it appears in the list. So, so it, it's, it's an open selection. And then, uh, and then when I select them, uh, you, you can see them uh, uh, appear. All right, so that's uh, that's uh, that's what we're going to build, and I'm going to show you the techniques. Now, XForms does actually have something called an open selection, but what what that means is that you've got your your values supplied, but it doesn't restrict you just to those ones, so that you can you can type something in as well. But what we want to do now is add uh, the item to the data, uh, and as you'll see, we'll also save the data to a fil file so that uh, so that uh, you're you're updating it and uh, and uh, uh, it, you retain the values that you've added. Um, so uh, we start off with the example we just had, where we've got our instance uh, our our items that we've uh, that we've got uh, from uh, from a file, and that we've uh, we're displaying uh, displaying them using a select. Um, I'm using the unstructured version of select here uh, because it's slightly harder to do, um, uh, and so just shows you some uh, some other uh, some other techniques into the bargain. Uh, so the structured version is actually a, a little easier, um, but uh, but otherwise they're very similar. Uh, so the same um, the the same technique uh, from earlier uh, for uh, for hiding. Uh, uh, hiding something. So uh, we've got a plus uh, toggle trigger uh, that uh, that opens up the area where you're going to input the control, uh, the in, uh, open up the area where the input control is uh, for adding the new item. So uh, that input control just looks like this. We just input a value, a string uh, that we're going to add uh, to the uh, to the data. Um, and um, we are then going to use an ha add a, have an OK button uh, that adds it to the data. So what does that OK button do? It's a trigger. 
um, and when you click on it, it inserts the item that we've just uh, we've just input there into uh, the data uh, um, where uh, where we uh, uh, where we want to store it. Then we set the data that we've just input back to uh, an empty string so that the next time we open it up, we don't see the value that uh, that we just typed in. Uh, and then we close it so that we go back to the original case. So just go back here. So what you see here is when I click on that, it opens up the input uh, and it's blank because I set it to blank. I type uh, 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 cream, for instance. I click on the OK that inserts that value that I've just typed in into the list of items and I can select it. Um, so that's that's the the whole the whole result. Um, but there are a number of things we can do to improve this. Firstly, we should add uh, hints to all the triggers where necessary to explain what they do. Um, uh, so I didn't show you that, but um, there's we can cancel it as well, so that we don't have to click on OK, but we can uh, click on Cancel. Um, so um uh, when we cancel we should also set the string back to uh, to the empty string so that if you type something in don't click on okay but then cancel so that uh, that the string gets cleared um hitting return uh, on the uh, on the input should also have the effect of clicking on the okay uh, we shouldn't accept an empty string to be inserted into the list um and uh, we shouldn't uh, accept values containing spaces um, because, uh, because we're using the unstructured select and that doesn't allow you to have spaces in the values. And the, as the last one, we shouldn't allow an existing value to be duplicated. Now, if we go back to the example again, uh, you'll see here that if I type um, uh, butter, immediately it says it, it may not contain uh, uh, spaces and if I take that space away it complains it duplicates an existing value so uh, uh, so we're going to add those uh, those abilities uh, to the uh, to the application so the hints are easy uh, just to uh, to the plus for instance we just add the hint add an item so that when you uh, hover over that uh, that that button uh, it just uh, tells you what's going to happen um, uh, the cancel, uh, so there you have the, tr the trigger for the cancelling. Uh, what it did do was just close, uh, close the, uh, uh, go, go back to the closed case, but now we do a set value on the data to make sure that it's, uh, that it's empty. Um, to the for the return case, so that when we hit return, instead of clicking on OK, what we have to do is uh, wait for the, uh, or, or listen for the event DOM activate. If we get a DOM activate, then we should send a DOM activate to the OK button. So that's what we're doing here. We're dispatching a DOM activate to the thing called OK. Oh, and we've added that as an ID on the OK button. Uh, and we do that when we receive the event, the EV event, the DOM activate. So that's also easy. Uh, we just pass the DOM activate onto the OK button. Um, to prevent the empty string, uh, um, uh, adding the empty string on the insert where we insert the data that we've typed in, um, we just check, we say, do the insert only if the, uh, the value we've typed in is not empty. Um, uh, there should be a new line here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, um, uh, we add a constraint on that value uh, that uh, that says um, uh, on the value that we're typing in, the produce type that we're typing in, we add a constraint on that that says it's not allowed to contain a space, uh, and then um, and then we can uh, we can give an alert here on the input for the produce value. Um, uh, we make it incremental true so that the the alert comes up immediately uh, as you type it in. Um, and so on. And so uh, the, there are a few more things that we do uh, uh, um, to add those extra, uh, for instance, preventing adding values with spaces and preventing duplicates, but that's all in the tutorial and you can see the extra details. Um, 
this is a longer exercise. Uh, um, you've got to change the example so that when you add a new element, so on, when you do that click on OK, um, that it's already selected in the value in the set of values that uh, uh, that uh, that you're trying to select on. Is that clear? So going back here, here, if I add um, um, if I add water here, I'm going to hit return now. That it should be selected already. So that's what that's the change you've got to make. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Great. So the 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 trick for this example is that um, when you insert the data value into the list of data values. You also insert the 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 string of that into the uh, into the list of things uh, uh, that you're buying uh, using a concatenate. So, so you just have to insert it in two different places into uh, into the values. I'm going to move on now. It's ten thirty. Uh, so the breaks at eleven. Uh, so uh, so we'll move on to the next uh, section, which is persistence. So that is to say. Um, when the data gets changed, how do we save it back into our items file? So um, the uh, the trick is uh, that uh, you can listen for when a data structure changes. So for instance, here's our items.xml instance called items. Uh, and uh, we can we've got put an observer on that. EV observer is items. And we're listening for the event xforms insert. So whenever something is inserted into that list, we can do something, whatever we want to do. And that something we want to do is save the data uh, by doing a send using the submission called save and the submission called save. Uh, and I'm sorry, that should, there should be some new lines in that, uh, but it takes, uh, takes the uh, instance items uh, and it sends it to the resource equals items dot, uh, dot XML. So, uh, um, and does a put. This is why you need a, a special server because uh, not all servers accept put um, uh, and you do definitely need one that accepts put. I believe that Apache can be, um, can be uh, uh, fixed so that it accepts put. I, ha it, I haven't succeeded in getting that to, to work, but one day I will and then, uh, and then I won't have to uh, supply a special server. Um, of course, uh, you should catch errors when you do a submission. So here's the uh, the submission, the save submission. You can see now uh, where I should have put the a new line in. Uh, so uh, we're saving the instance items to a resource called items.xml, to a file called items.xml. We're using the method put. And then we want to listen for submit error, xform submit error. Um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, if the submission has not uh, not worked, which might be because the server doesn't accept put, it might be because the directory that you're saving to is not writable, or it might be because you've got any, no internet. Um, so then you get that event, and then you can uh, you can do, for instance, a message, uh, which just pops up a, a dialogue, say, well, actually pops up a monologue um, that says uh, the uh, the the data hasn't been saved, and gives you. Uh, the res the re response reason phrase that the uh, uh, the server gave you for why it was not possible. However, a, a bet a better method than just popping up a message like that is to um, save that uh, that that reason uh, somewhere in a message instant uh, in an instance in a in a, a value message uh, and. Um, um, and then so that you can display it so that it, it remains displayed. Um, uh, and um, and if that means that if the submit has been successful, so we listen for XForm submits done, um, then we can uh, set that message to blank. So in other words, if there's an error, we save the error in the message. And if there is no error, then we just uh, blank out the message. Uh, and again, we use the relevance technique. We say the message is only relevant when it's non-empty. 
uh, and then we can output the message. And so that means that message would, will only appear uh, when, when it's got a value. And class equals error, we can make it red or big or whatever uh, in the CSS. So it means that when there's an error, uh, it will only do, be displayed when there's an error. Uh, so um, in the example that you've been working on, um, uh, this is a fairly simple uh, exercise, make the check for duplicates case independent. Uh, so at the moment, uh, it, if you typed in capital letters milk and lower letters milk, it would see them as, uh, as different things. Uh, and so I want you to uh, change it so that, uh, so that it spots a duplicate if it's the only difference is, that, uh, is, is the case. Uh, it needs two changes uh, and uh, a reminder that um, the, uh, the function you need is called lower dash case, uh, which turns any string into, a, into its lowercase version. Okay. All right, go. Okay, I'm going to carry on. So, um, having saved uh, data, oh, and I should say that this this technique is actually uh, what I should have done in the earlier one, where I said you needed to include the items.xml file. Um, uh, I should have put this in the earlier example, um, and I'm uh, and I will now. Uh, what what we're now going to do is is read back the uh, the uh, saved data, but if it's not there, do something sensible anyway. So what we're going to do is, uh, so, so you have an instance resource equals items.xml, uh, which loads uh, that file into, into the data. But the problem is, and the problem was in, in your case, if that file's not there, then, uh, then it fails. So what, you want to do, what we want to do is initialize our list with some, some initial values, and then try and replace that with uh, the items.xml file. Uh, and if that fails, then just just ignore ignore it. And so we start off with our initial values. So uh, we initialize the instance with default values, whatever values we want, and then we attempt to read the file. So here's the initialization of the file. Uh, we're going to the resource we want to uh, get is items.xml. Um, we are going to replace the instance called list. And if there's a submit error, uh, so in other words, if it failed to read that file, then we just stop uh, stop the event and we cancel its default action. So the submit error, we say, okay, there was a submit error, but we don't. Uh, we're, we're going to ignore it. We're going to switch it off. Uh, we don't care about it. So those two extra um, uh, um, uh, attributes, propagate and default action. Default action stops whatever Xforms would normally do if it got a submit error. And propagate is, means don't let anybody else see that this, uh, this event has happened, uh, stop it immediately. So in other words, we try, if it fails, we don't care. And so to set that in, in motion, uh, when we get the Xforms ready event at the beginning, um, then we just send that submission uh, to try and initialize the data. Um, oh, sorry. Um, actually, in the future, this will be easier. This is one of the changes uh, coming in the, in the next version of Xforms, uh, that uh, if, uh, if you put, um, uh, if you try to initialize it uh, with SRC, uh, if that fails, then it uses the content of the instance instead. So, uh, so uh, you, you won't have to do this in the future. You can just say, this is where I'd like to get the data from. And if that fails, then here's, here's some uh, uh, default data. Was that a question? No. Um, OK, uh, so uh, at startup, after a successful restore of the saved data, what I want you to do is save. So after a successful restore of the saved data, save the instance to another file and add a button to reset the data back to its initial state by re reloading that new file. So basically, uh, you, you start up the, uh, the application, uh, you make changes to the data, and then you say, no, actually, I don't want that. Click on restore, uh, and you go back to the initial state. OK. 
go. Keeping lists uh, sorted, this is a short one. There's no exercise afterwards, uh, but it's uh, uh, an interesting, a useful technique to know. So for instance, uh, if I want to add a, um, a value to this list, uh, let's uh, say uh, uh, the value is, uh, doesn't matter what, insert. Uh, but then if I want to change that to 2022 as well and add a different value there, 617, insert, then it gets inserted in the right place. So in other words, we're keeping the list in, uh, uh, sorted on dates. How? What's the technique for doing that? Well, so we, there we've got our values. Um, and when we've got a new value, uh, which is uh, the thing insert origin, uh, then we uh, insert it after the values whose date are less than the date of our new value. And that's all, all all that you need to know. You use insert with position after, and then uh, you select the values that you want to be after. Or you can do it the other way around, uh, and you can insert it before uh, the, uh, the the values uh, whose, uh, whose date are greater. That's it. OK, good. All right, so on to the next thing. Uh, and uh, we're uh, going to look at how suggestion, how to do suggestions. So. Uh, when you have to enter your country, for instance, into an address, um, if you just use a simple select, then that's such a long list of stuff that is scrolled down. And you've probably seen the uh, the video of the comedian who's uh, who who, uh, who uh, complains about having to scroll down huge long lists of um, of uh, of countries, and uh, and especially when. Uh, if you don't know where your country is going to turn up in the list, for instance, um, is it England or Great Britain or the United Kingdom or is it Netherlands or the Netherlands? And uh, and so uh, it, it, you have you have to search. So what what we're going to do is instead of having a a, a, a select like that, uh, you'll you just start typing, uh, and it'll give you su uh, suggestions, uh, and then uh, and then you can. Uh, make that suggestion if you want, or uh, you can just type uh, uh, type type it out yourself. Uh, uh, so that's what we're going to show how uh, how to do. So the traditional method is um, is to have this select a uh, select one uh, referencing the country that you uh, that you want, and getting the item set from the the, the instance countries. There's a bracket missing there. Um, uh, uh, so just the standard, uh, the standard select one method uh, with an output. But of course, it's a, it's a huge long list, uh, 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 several some hundreds of uh, of uh, of um, values. Uh, so we're doing a plain input instead, where we just uh, input uh, country, but we make sure it's incremental so that as we type, uh, its value gets updated, and then uh, a select one for suggestions that match the input. So what, what you saw then was uh, the um, uh, a pop-up. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to, uh, we've got a value uh, called suggestion um, uh, and uh, we're getting our list of items for the suggestion from the countries that start with the value that we're typing in. So it's as simple as that. That uh, that is that will just work uh, uh, with uh, with uh, a couple of caveat caveats. Uh, first, we make this this that select one only relevant if country has a value, um, so that it doesn't pop anything up if you if uh, if you haven't typed anything. So it, it's only when you start typing something. So uh, so that the suggestion, which is that that ref there on the select one. Uh, is only relevant if somebody's typed something into uh, the country value. Uh, so that's what makes the the, the pop up happen. Um, so that so the suggestions pop up when you start typing. That's thanks to the relevance bind. As you type, the suggestions adapt. That's thanks to the incremental is true on the input uh, and the filter on the select one. Um, 
it's a, a case sensitive match, uh, but uh, you've done an, uh, already done an exercise on uh, making a, a, a case insensitive uh, match. Uh, so instead of saying starts with uh, the, uh, what you've typed in, you start, uh, you say uh, starts with lower case of that. Um, and the last thing is that when you select a suggestion, nothing happens. We have to actually do something with that suggestion. And that's the bit that we're changing now. Um, so um, what, uh, uh, what, what we've got is that uh, we're listening uh, for when uh, the suggestion changes its value, when its value changes. That is when somebody clicks uh, on one of the uh, one of the items that are suggested, that changes the value of uh, the suggestion, uh, and then we just copy it across uh, to the to the um, uh, uh, to the country uh, uh, value that we're typing in. Um, uh, there's uh, a couple of other things we should do. Having made a selection like that, then the suggestion should disappear. So we change the relevance uh, on the uh, suggestion uh, so that either the country is not empty, uh, sorry, so that the country is not empty and also uh, it's not equal to the suggestion. So once the suggestion and the country are equal, the suggestions disappear. Uh, uh, and uh, the other thing that we should do is make sure that uh, somebody can only type in um, a valid country. Uh, and so we add a constraint to the country uh, that it has to appear uh, in the list of countries. Um, and there's one other Im improvement uh, that you can uh, check on in the tutorial. So going back here, um, uh, that's why this uh, lights up red like this, uh, because the value is not in the country, uh, uh, in the list of countries. Um, uh, but there is a suggestion that matches, uh, but we haven't yet got a valid uh, a valid uh, value. Uh, so uh, that's why it's red and won't accept it. Okay. Um, so the exercise, take that last example on the tutorial. And instead of matching suggestions on the start of what's typed in, match on whether the country contains what's been typed in. So in other words, use the function contains. Should be fairly easy to do, shouldn't take you long. Any questions? Okay, go to it. So uh, yeah, the next uh, section. So um, uh, dealing with unknown data structures. So, um, uh, it, it is possible that you're going to read in a file, as it were, an XML file, that you don't know actually how it's structured. And so how would you, how would you deal with that? Most of the XForms, XForms stuff expects a certain structure to the file, and, uh, and then you know what, what, the, what, the, uh, what the structure is and how to access the elements. Well, how do you deal with a file that you don't know uh, how to deal with? So uh, what I'm going to sh just show you is um, um, displaying the contents of a file that you don't know uh, what, uh, what the structure is. So the basic technique is to repeat ref equals star. So in other words, repeat all over the children elements. And here's just a simple version. Um, we output the local name of, uh, of that element and then its contents. So the local name of dot and then dot. Um, so if this is our, if this is our file, um, which is uh, a, a typical um, response from a server in this case. Um, uh, uh, so uh, it, it's uh, it's showing what uh, what a, a reply a two hundred uh, reply looks like from a server. Uh, you get an en empty error type. Uh, you get the resource URI that you uh, that you submitted to the status code two hundred. It was successful, and then a number of headers. Um, Containing content length uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and a value, and then content type and a value. So, using this XML, uh, sorry, this X forms here, uh, you get something that looked like this, which is uh, basically useful. Uh, but what you can see is that if the children are structured, then everything just gets um, uh, gets appended, uh, uh, concatenated. Yes. Um, actually, I think this is CSS that's doing it. 
CSS collapses the spaces, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is well, so this is not a CSS tutorial. Um, yeah, yeah, but there are issues with CSS that you have to deal with for that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this, if, if that's, if that's, uh, um, that might be enough just to get you, get you going, but um, uh, what you can do then is uh, to repeat over the elements, uh, output the local name, and then if um, the count of the number of children is zero, uh, then just output the content, so ref equals dot, if the count of the number of children is zero, or, uh, uh, so that will output the content if there are no children. And if there are children, the next one will work, repeat ref equals star uh, the for the children. Um, and if there are no children, then that repeat will produce uh, absolutely nothing. So in that case, we do exactly the same thing, the local name and the content. And of course you could nest that several times. So uh, with our, with our uh, 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 server res response, sorry, with our server response, uh, we get uh, we get something that looks like this, and so you could you could nest that several levels deep um, uh, if you wanted. But of course, you're limited to the depth that you can uh, can nest. So, um, uh, oh yeah, well I'll talk about that in a moment. If you need the root uh, value, then uh, then uh, you you just uh, output the local name of slash star. Um, there's just uh, there's just one, of course, so that star just matches the top element. And if you want uh, attributes, then you can repeat over ref equals at star um, in a in a similar way. Um, but um, if you don't want if you don't know how deep it's uh, nested, then you have to use a different technique. And so what you do is you repeat ref equals descendant star, and so um, so that gives you all the elements. Uh, and then for each element, you can work out what depth it's nested at by counting the number of ancestors. And so then you can indent it correctly. So I won't, I'm not going to show you this on the, uh, on the screen now, but it's all in the tutorial, how to get the, the right indentation by counting the number of, uh, uh, number of ancestors. No exercise for this one. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, um, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot, a lot of these things you'd like to 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 uh, um, uh, format in different ways, and uh, and CSS is there uh, for the for the uh, for modifying your presentation. Um, the basic uh, and most useful technique uh, is to uh, is to calculate a class name. Uh, so, for instance, if that ref uh, was to a number and you wanted to have um, negative numbers in, uh, in red and, uh, and uh, positive numbers in green, then you could calculate uh, based on the value of that ref, if it was negative uh, class equals red, and if it's uh, positive class equals uh, green or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and, and then as the value changes, then so would the presentation. Um, if a simple class name is not enough, uh, for instance, if you actually need values uh, to to change, for, in, for instance, you want to change the margin left and margin top, and um, if we get to it, uh, you'll see an example of this being used. Then you can calculate a style attribute. Uh, so for instance, in this case, we're calculating margin left and margin top, top based off of two, uh, two values somewhere in the instance, off, off, offset X and offset Y. Uh, and then you can just, uh, uh, apply a style to to a group, for instance, or whatever element that it is you want to change. So those are the basic techniques. Uh, it's all you really need uh, um, to be able to uh, adapt the uh, presentation according to values. Uh, uh, and so let us move on to tabbed, uh, uh, tabbed interfaces. So in the uh, in the earlier uh tutorial the introductory tutorial i give an example of this um uh but um uh we're we're going to make it uh, we're going to make it a, a, a bit fancier than the the one we had before so what we've got here is uh four tabs uh, uh it's uh, it changes its presentation uh, as you hover over it and if you if you click on it, then uh, you get the tab the the values of those tabs so that's this is what we're going to uh going to uh, produce. So the traditional um, 
approach uh, is to use switch with different cases. Uh, but in this, in this example, we're going to use the relevant style techniques. So uh, using the, the, uh, the earlier techniques we used for making things visible or not. Um, only this case, we've got a number of groups uh, and we're going to ensure that only one of those groups is visible by using relevance. So only one of the cases is relevant at any one time. So, uh, so here is uh, a, an instance where um, uh, we've got uh, the selected value, the one that we're currently looking at, and then uh, 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 the four tabs uh, that uh, home products support and contact. And we're going to make those values relevant according to the value that's been in the selected uh, 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 value uh, at child. So here, uh, and it, what notes the nested binds here, it's a, a useful thing when you've got to deal with several things in one instance. So we take the instance tab and home is re only relevant is if selected uh, um, has got the value home and products is only relevant if selected has only got the value products and so on. So in other words, uh, only one of them uh, will ever be uh, uh, valid, relevant. And then we add four triggers and uh, all the triggers do is set the value of, uh, um, of selected to one of, those, one of those values. So one trigger is for home, one trigger for products and so on. But there's an alternative. So there's an alternative to having four triggers like that. We could actually use a select one for it. Uh, uh, so that uh, we've got the four values and then selecting any one of those is, uh, is, has the same effect as putting that value into, uh, uh, into, uh, into selected. So um, it has uh, some, uh, some advantages, uh, but, uh, and thanks to CSS, uh, you can style a select one. So this thing here up here is just a styled select one, uh, um, just using CSS to style it completely differently. And in the tutorial, it explains how to do that. Um, so your exercise is to generalize this example. So it's a longer, a bit of a longer exercise. So uh, what we're going to do is um, uh, put on each element um, uh, the, its name, and then the bind uh, can just uh, apply to all the elements, the sub-elements of, uh, of the tab. Uh, um, uh, so you say that each element is only um, relevant if the selected va value, which I put up, up above now as an attribute because, uh, because, uh, because you don't want that to be uh, uh, irrelevant. Um, it's uh, each element of the, each, uh, uh, each sub element of tab uh, is only relevant if the, its name has been put in the selected uh, value. And then change the select one so that it gets its, the select one, so it gets its labels and values from there. What this means is that you can add, easily add a new tab then just by adding it into this structure uh, and adding one more group um, uh, that gets selected. So this is your exercise to generalize it uh, and then add a new tab to the instance. Okay. Go. Let us move on. So last modified. So if you are like me, a user of uh, Emacs, you'll know that very useful facility it has that if you start to edit a buffer and the file has changed since you last read it in, it will warn you and say, the file that you're editing has changed. Uh, are you sure you want to edit, edit the file? Or similarly, if you edit it and then try to save it and it's changed in the meantime, it'll say, well, it's it's now different, the file's different. Are you sure you want to overwrite it? These are very handy uh, things when you're editing files. And, um, and similarly with, uh, with Xforms apps, especially if you've got a copy on your desktop and a copy in your telephone and you edit a file with a, or a file changes because you've used it in your phone, then you go home and then you start using the same app at home and, uh, and the data has changed, but it, uh, that, uh, it's still looking at the old data, then uh, it would be really good to be able to check um, 
uh, whether uh, whether whether the file is still the same one that you think it is. So this is about that, how to find out when the file was last modified and make sure it's the same version that you're dealing with. So I see that. Uh, uh, so what we're going to do here is uh, is uh, uh, save, uh, check, uh, check the uh, that, that that it's um, uh, the last modified date is the same uh, and and then uh, overwrite it just to show you the error that you get that there's a mismatch. Um, so when you do a submission of a file, when you when you either get it or put it, um, uh, the, sub the, the server returns a number of useful values uh, whether you've done a, whether you've got a submit done or a submit error. Uh, so these are the uh, the values that you get. Um, the resource URI, so where you were trying to uh, get or put to. Uh, so you know if it says 404, then you, at least you can see what it was that you were trying to uh, to get uh, and and see what you mistake you've made. The re response status code, so that's the regular. Uh, HTTP uh, codes um, uh, uh, like 200 and 404 and so on. Um, the reason phrase, so the, the English explanation of, of that status code. Uh, and then a number of response headers, and you saw an example of that earlier. Uh, zero or more header elements, each representing uh, a header in the response from the server with two child elements, a name and a value uh, 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 containing the name and value of the header. Uh, additionally, for XForm submit error, you get an error type, uh, which uh, comes from XForms rather than from the server, um, uh, that's telling you the type of error involved. And that might be because the submit didn't even get done uh, because of some, uh, some, uh, some problem uh, with the data or with the, how you were submitting it. So for instance, you can't do two submissions uh, uh, simultaneously or one after the other until the first one is completed. Um, uh, you might be trying to submit something and there's no data. Uh, the data might not validate if, if you've asked for validation. Uh, the data uh, uh, might not, uh, uh, so, so uh, the XForms coming back might, uh, might not be valid uh, XForms. Uh, sorry, the XML coming back might not be valid XML. So there's a parse error. A resource error that uh, you've given uh, um, uh, some, uh, some URL that's not valid. Uh, or target error that where you said you want to put the result doesn't exist. And finally, you get the response body that does come from uh, from the server. Um, and uh, that, uh, that's the, the message that you normally get from a server that gets displayed, uh, for instance, for a 404. So you get all those return values, and so you can access them. Uh, and uh, uh, so you access them with um, the event function. So when you've got, for instance, an XForm submit done, uh, then you can, uh, for instance, do a set value of the resource URI by doing event resource URI. But the one that we're interested in this case is the last modified date. So one of the headers that comes back says uh, when the file that you've got or, uh, 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 yeah, that you've just got, when it was last modified. Uh, and so you get do that by getting the response headers slash slash, so we don't care how deep it is. And you're looking for something with the name uh, equals last modified, and then you want its value. So this is the technique that we use. Every time you save the file, having saved it, we do an additional head on the file to get back the date that the server think the date and time that the server says it was saved at, and then you can save that uh, uh, for checking later on. So, uh, having done a save, here's the submission to do a save. Uh, we've put the file to uh, data.xml, and when we get the uh, XForm submit done back, then we do a send on the submission head, and the submission head just does a, a head so uh, on the file. And uh, when that comes back with an XForm submit done, we can uh, set the value LM, uh, last modified, to the value of the response headers last modified. So having done that, now with our data, we've saved the date and time that the server says it was last saved. And so 
uh, when we want to go to overwrite the file, we can do a check uh, that the last modified value of the file is still the same. So it's exactly the same. We do, uh, we do a head on it. Uh, and this time we uh, set the value check uh, with, the, uh, with the last modified uh, value. Uh, and then, um, for instance, we can have a value somewhere in an instance called mismatch uh, that's only relevant um, uh, when um, uh, it's calculated by checking to see uh, uh, whether the last modified equals the check value. Uh, if, the, if it doesn't equal it, then we set the value of mismatch uh, to the word mismatch, for instance, uh, and we say it's only relevant when it's not empty. And if they do match, then we set it to empty and, uh, and everything's okay. So uh, this is the technique of, uh, of, uh, of relevance of, of error messages uh, that we used earlier. Okay, good. Uh, another technique uh, that uh, is uh, is useful is uh, is uh, to be able to use the mouse. And um, if we have time, we'll you'll see this uh, in use. So um, I've uh, uh, this this area here, this this little box here, um, receives uh, is set up to receive uh, mouse events, and so uh, it gets uh, it gets the x and y value. And the state of the mouse, uh, so it's up and click click the mouse uh, down. Uh, and what you can do is uh, then change the cursor, uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So you can see that as I click down, it goes from a hand uh, to a cross, uh, so that I can uh, I, so the user knows uh, what state the the mouse is in. So how do we do that? It's actually very simple. So we have a, an instance value somewhere of, um, uh, for the mouse that so, so it saves its x and y value and the state of the of the button, and uh, uh, that thing that we were looking at is just a group, uh, as it, and it had a label move mouse here, and what we're doing is listening to for the events mouse move mouse down mouse up. So when mouse move happens, then we just have to get the client x and client y uh, values from the event. Um, when we get the mouse down event, then we just have to set uh, the state to down. Uh, and uh, uh, when when we get a mouse up event, then we set the state to up. Uh, and then it just displays those three values. So, so that's uh, that, that's what you were seeing here. Those those values being changed. Um, so uh, the only other thing is uh, to have a value for the cursor. Uh, so uh, we can say if the state is up, then uh, the cursor should be a pointer, and if the state is not up, then it should be uh, uh, the so it's down. Uh, then it should be uh, the move uh, value, and then we can just uh, uh, add um, a style element uh, to the uh, to the group uh, that says the cursor has got to be whatever value is in the cursor uh, uh, element. Simple. Again, uh, no exercises. In fact, uh, we've come to the end of the exercises, and that's uh, good because uh, we've only got about 20 minutes. So now um, there are a large number of examples uh, that, uh, that we can look at. Uh, and so I'm going to um, pick examples uh, at more or less at random uh, until our time is up uh, and just show these techniques that you've learned um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, being used, but um, SVG is uh, is is a, a useful thing to have in XForms. So I'm going to uh, go straight to uh, some examples of uh, of use of X SVG by building a clock in in XForms, a, a ticking clock with hands. So uh, what we what we've got here is uh, an instance with the uh, where we're going to save the time and. Um, We've uh, we've got uh, uh, we, there's a, a function local date time which will tell you the local date and time of the computer that you're running on. Uh, so if uh, if I run this uh, example, so I'm going to output the time. So nothing happens except that we see the time that uh, that I started this uh, this up, and uh, um, the date is right. The time is off by an hour. Um, hmm. 
Okay. Um, it says, yeah, still set to summertime. Well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> what we're going to now do is make that clock tick. Um, uh, but first, we're going to uh, separate the time uh, into its hours, uh, minutes, and seconds uh, by just calculating substrings uh, of that of the uh, of the time value. Uh, and now we're going to output the time, but also the concatenation of the hours, minutes, and seconds. So there we go. Uh, that's uh, that's that's uh, that's three elements separated out. Next step is to make the clock tick. So when we start up, so when we get the X forms ready at the beginning of the sorry at the beginning of the X forms, um, then we're going to dispatch an event, our own event, which we're going to call tick, and we're going to send it to the model, which is just the the the, the basic model of the of X forms. So when XForm starts up, it sends just one tick event to the model. Now in the model, what we're going to do is every time we receive an, a, a tick, so every time we see that tick, we set the value of the time uh, variable to the local date time again. And then we dispatch, dispatch another tick to the same place, but with a delay of a thousand milliseconds. So in other words, a tick will be sent every second. So once it gets its first tick, it sets uh, sets the uh, 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 the time, uh, and then uh, uh, dispatches uh, another tick a second later. This is the only change that we've made to that last thing that you saw. But now you can see uh, every second uh, the the time uh, is ticking away, uh, uh, is being being updated. So now we've got uh, we've got uh, data that's changing every second. Now we're going to turn this into a analog clock using SVG. So first thing we're going to do is add hands to the instance, uh, the, the hands of our clock. Now the lengths here are just percentages because SVG is uh, is um, uh, doesn't have units in it. it uh, you, it's uh, it's uh, it's better to do it as percentages um, because it's uh, it's scalable. Uh, so we're going to say the hour hand is. Um, so if you imagine the clock being 100 wide, then we're going to have the circle around the clock of being 90% of that 100. And the, hand, the hour hand is going to be 30%. And the minute and second hands are going to be 40% long. Um, and um, what we want to do to these hands is uh, calculate the angle of the hand on the clock. And uh, so uh, the second hand, for instance, um, um, Class, yeah, class is hour, minute, and second. Uh, the second hand, for instance, is just the number of seconds, the value that we've calculated, the number of seconds, times six, because the seconds goes from naught uh, to uh, 60, and so the angle is going to go from naught to 360. Similarly, for the minutes, the minutes go from one to 60, in naught to 60, so the uh, the angle goes from, uh, uh, from uh, naught to, to, to 360. The hour hand is a little bit more complicated because, um, you don't want it to change only on the hour. You want it also to change every minute. And so you have to take the hour uh, uh, times 30 and then add the minutes divided by two in order to get, to, to get the right angle. Now we're going to add some SVG. So uh, we're going to circle of radius 45. So that the clock is 90% wide. Uh, we'll give it a class of bezel, which, uh, which we can then change in the CSS. And then we're going to repeat over every hand we're going to draw a, a, a line uh, from naught naught to. Now the problem is that um, SVG, the positive direction is is down and not up in mathematics. So we have to we have to do uh, a, a negative there to get the uh, the position. So this is the hour hand. This is a hand that starts at the top. Uh, so we're drawing it we're drawing it vertically here, uh, and then we rotate it by the angle that we've calculated for the hand. And we give it a class of either hours, minutes, or seconds uh, so that we can uh, we can div di give different displays for the different hands. So it repeats over the hands, and we do a little circle in the middle. And there you go. So uh, this is now uh, a very simple clock, uh, but uh, the time as the time ticks, 
uh, uh, which you can still see uh, uh, displayed above the uh, that those that then modifies the angles, and every second uh, the uh, the hands get redrawn at the new angles. If we want to add some decoration to that, well, it's just the same process. All those little uh, uh, lines are just are just hands that don't move. Uh, so you just use the the the, the same process uh, to, to draw to draw the uh, to draw the hands to draw the, uh, the the little lines. And that's it, really. It's a, a, a surprisingly small number of lines uh, to do uh, to do uh, a fairly uh, a fairly nice uh, uh, result. <coughs> I've um, I've looked online for uh, examples of uh, of clocks like this written in C. Uh, I found uh, I found a number uh, of them. Uh, the largest was four thousand lines long. The smallest was one thousand lines long, uh, and we've done it in about twenty lines. So uh, so as you can see, it's uh, it's uh, it's quite powerful. Uh, uh, um, powerful thing to do. Right, we've got a quarter of an hour left, so I do want to do the maps because that shows some of the power. So, um, you can, um, if you put uh, a, the URL of an image in your data like this, so I'm getting my tiles from OpenStreetMap, um, you and, and if you output it with, for instance, ref equals URL, then you will get that string output. Fair enough. But you can add a media type to the output control that says that you want it displayed as an image. And then it will download that uh, image for you and display it. So this is exactly the uh, control necessary uh, to, uh, to get that, um, uh, to get that, uh, that tile from OpenStreetMap. OK, so that's, uh, that's the basic uh, that we're going to use. We're going to start getting tiles from OpenStreetMap, and we're going to start sticking them together and use the mouse um, to, uh, 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 to control what, what gets, gets viewed. So an OpenStreetMap URL is made up of the site that you're getting it from, the zoom, the x, and the y, and then dot ping. So um, here we go. Uh, we're going to make an instance. Uh, where the map contains the site that we're getting it from, uh, tile.openstreetmap.org, openstreetmap.org, the zoom uh, value 10, and the x and y coordinates uh, um, of, in this case, 511 and 340. And we then calculate the URL from that by concatenating the site, the zoom, a slash, the x, a slash, the y, the, uh, and then uh, the dot png. <coughs> But now that we have the data, we can all now also input the different parts, for instance, input the zoom that we want. Um, uh, so that means we can enter different values for the tile coordinates. Uh, and because XForms keeps all the relationships up to date, a new tile URL is calculated and the con corresponding tile is displayed. So, so here I've uh, made input uh, easy. Uh, so now we're looking at Amsterdam, uh, but if I, go to the next tile so you can hello internet okay and i can go down and up so all i'm doing here is is changing the uh, x and y values um and um uh and it's just automatically getting the next tile for me now, uh, I didn't do the zoom because the zoom button doesn't work. And the reason is that uh, on OpenStreetMap, um, the X and Y coordinates change at each level of zoom. At the outer level, most level of zoom, which is zero, there's only one tile, which has X, X zero and Y zero. At level one, the coordinates double in both directions. So there are four tiles. At level two, there are eight tiles. At level three, 16, and so on. Uh, and uh, ge in general, um, there are two to the power of Z at level Z up to level 19. So in other words, we have to recalculate the X and Y coordinates for each zoom level. So to make the zoom work properly, we have to save our location that we're interested in looking at in world coordinates, which is actually the deepest level of, uh, the most detailed level of zoom. Um, 
uh, and then calculate the tile at any level of zoom from that. So the scale uh, is two to the power of 26 minus the, our zoom value. And then our X is the floor of our world X value divided by scale and the Y similarly. So in X forms, we just bind uh, the scale to the power of two to the 26 minus zoom and so on. So we calculate those values. And so now the zoom does work. And so I can zoom in, except the internet's not working. Hello. Hmm. My finger's not working either. Am I not connected? Well, you'll have to just take my word for it for the time being. That, no, no, no. For some reason, it's working there? Okay, all right, so it's my my computer. Yeah, there's a question? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so a uh, question uh, on the Slack, why is it showing, showing GMT plus two? And there must be something, it's something wrong with my computer and I don't know the answer. Um, uh, but uh, apparently my computer hasn't discovered that we've gone back to winter time. So it still thinks it's summertime. Uh, so, so now we fix the zoom. Um, so the next step uh, is, to, uh, is to make this a useful application. Now, the problem is, a problem is, that when you zoom in and out, you get a tile that includes the location that you want, but that location is, of course, on a different position on the, on the tile. So, for instance, here on the left-hand side, you've got that plus approximately in the middle of the, of the tile. Uh, but when you zoom in, uh, you, get, you, you get the sub-tile, as it were, that, uh, that, uh, that includes that location. But on... Fortunately, the location is now in the corner of the tile. Um, uh, so, and that's because, um, well, uh, I think the, the diagram shows uh, obviously why, why that's the case. Now, ideally what you want is that as you zoom in, the location that you're interested in stays in the middle of the screen. You don't want it bouncing over the screen all the time. So we have to deal with that. And how we do it is, is like this. We have nine tiles in the background, as it were, um, we, that includes our location uh, in the middle tile. And then we do some negative offsets so that uh, we look at four tiles or four tiles wide uh, through a porthole. Uh, so we don't see those ones at the back. Um, and uh, we, we do some negative offsets so that our position is always in the middle of the porthole. So that as we zoom in, our position is always in the middle of the screen and not bouncing around the screen. So the porthole stays static on the screen and the tiles underneath are going to be shif shifted actually using CSS uh, so that the location remains the same. So uh, we calculate the offput of X and Y uh, that our location has from the center. Don't worry about it, uh, exactly how that's ca calculated. Uh, you, saw, uh, you saw earlier uh, using style, uh, uh, with uh, with um, attribute uh, uh, value attribute values, so we uh, we just use a style on uh, on on that thing, and now now we have uh, uh, so we're looking at four four uh, uh, four tiles as it were, and there are more that are being hidden from us. But now my internet is broken so i hope it works on your computer anyway uh, but as you as you zoom in you get uh, uh, you get you get the same effect you get the right effect and i don't know what is wrong with my wi-fi it does say that i'm connected i don't know why i'm being refused yeah no i'm being refused Well, anyway, in the in, I hope that the version uh, that you can see on the on the tutorial uh, uh, makes it obvious. Uh, but what you can see here is uh, what I've what I've made visible here is the bit that you're looking at at the porthole and the stuff in the background that you're not being seen, you're not seeing. And as you move 
as you zoom in, you can see you can see the same place in the center, um, but the bits uh, in the background, the hidden bits being uh, being moved around. Um, so you've seen how to use the mouse. I don't have to tell you about that uh, 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 again. But uh, what we want to do then is to be able to drag uh, the the um, the uh, the map around. Um, and so what we do that there is uh, we uh, we save the start and end points of a move so that we calculate how far we uh, as we drag. So what we're doing as we're dragging. We're changing the X and Y coordinates, and everything gets updated uh, automatically to match. Um, so we capture the start point of the drag uh, um, uh, using uh, using the, the the mouse when the mouse goes down, um, and uh, when the mouse uh, while the mouse down while the mouse button is down, we send we save uh, the uh, the the mouse X and Y values, uh, and then calculate the move as just the end from the start. So what happens here is that you see, as I, as I click down, as I click down, uh, it tells me how far it moved in each direction. So I'm just calculating that from my start position and my end position, which is being constantly updated. And having done that, then I can I can move um, uh, move the maps suitably. Um, so when the dragging stops, then we just reset our x and y, uh, and who knows, maybe. Well, yeah, you can see it. You can see it working as long as I don't have to download some new tiles. So you can see that happening. So all I'm doing here with my mouse is actually changing the x and y value. Um, but uh, Xforms is just uh, uh, automatically doing all the updates, uh, and so I get my my move for free. I don't have to do very much work to do this. So um, you can add some uh, some bells and whistles at the end. Uh, for instance, you can get your maps from a, a, a different site. So who knows? Maybe this uh, this will work. No, that's, that's my my internet is is not working. Um, but again, the version in the uh, in the um, in the tutorial uh, should should work. But uh, just by adding a, a select one, I change wh which site I get my tiles from, and so I get a different style of map. Um, so it's only about 150 lines of Xforms code, which uh, which is not very much for such a a, a complicated uh, application. So uh, I think uh, I, I like this example because it demonstrates how much you can do with very little, uh, very little coding. Now, um, this is the end. I'm not going to go any further. So um, last five minutes, any questions before lunch? Uh, is it possible to uh, yeah, have abstractions like um, this map example that you just showed um, to be used in other X forms as an include? Almost for, uh, for reusable. Say, uh, so come to my talk after lunch, and I will show you. Yeah. All right. There was somebody else over there. I think put a hand up. Yeah. Hmm. Hi, O'Neill Del Prep. Um, just you mentioned earlier about other implementations uh, from the one that from John. Is that available, or is it? Is it open source or is um as, as far as I uh, yeah yeah so so there's Orbion uh, uh, and uh, and the one that I'm using here which is uh, XSLT forms they're both open source um so yeah you you can you can get hold of those uh, the the difference is that um, XSLT forms is client side so your client does all the work um, uh, and Orbion is uh, a server side based, so it does a, a a lot of the work on the server and then sends you the results. Yes, is is there a way to make X forms accessible, like in the browser for assistive technology? Quite honestly, X forms is designed to be accessible, and uh, uh, there was a Finnish implementation um, that demonstrated that by taking an unchanged X form and putting it through a speech 
browser so that it only read what was on the screen. Uh, so in in principle, in principle, X forms is by design accessible, um, and uh, the the any lack of accessibility is more due to the to problems in the in the browser than problems in the X forms. But the answer is it's very easy to make X forms accessible. Matt Patterson. Um, so the question then is, if if it's dependent on the implementations, not destroying the accessibility are, are do you know if the implementation any of the implementations are or are not accessible good question i haven't done a study of that certainly there's a question in the zoom if accessibility forms isn't it would be easy well easy i mean it wouldn't be difficult to make to make it access, accessible yeah so so. If there's a question in zoom can Okay, um, I just learned of the four framework, which which uh, advertises itself as a an X formish framework. So I was wondering, what do you think of it, uh, Stephen? I think there's somebody in the in the in the audience. What, what, what do you think of it? What do I think of it? I think that they should make it more X forms like. <laughs> I don't see the re I don't see the value in having two different standards. Okay. Well, well yes. yes, one more, one more question. question. <laughs> Martin, Martin Middle. Martin, Martin thanks. Um, the big uh, x -forms implementation or the big uh, x -forms, uh, application that you mentioned at the start of the talk, um, would you happen to know if that's based on x -forms 1 or 1.1 1 1 or 2.0 or? Um, it, it's it's a 1, 1 plus. 1, 1 plus. Uh, so, so it uses some of the bits of x -forms 2 um, uh, that are have been defined and and actually are available in all all the implementations already um but it's it's basically one one and a bit more it's it's, it's he uses all beyond cool i saw that the package uh, you made us install is using uh, 1.3 of xslt forms where uh, the uh, github repo says it's now 1.7 so it might be advisable to upgrade uh, XSLT forms. I agree. Uh, they they changed the way that they used uh, CSS, and so a lot of my examples need would all need to be one by one updated to you to uh, to to adapt to how they use CSS. So um, so that's why I use the older version, which still uses the old version of CSS. Yeah. So after after lunch, we will be uh, listening again to Stephen Pemberton, who will very briefly, then very briefly discuss or mention all of the new features coming into XForms two. If there are no further questions, there's one more question. Okay. So, uh, Stephen, I have a bit of an advanced question here. Uh, do you have any plans to better accommodate Schematron-based validations within XForms? Uh, you know, obviously, one can go about uh, programmatically parsing a Schematron file and trying, trying to uh, stuff various uh, constraint attributes with as much as can be done to... Uh, properly validate the various fields in question, but uh, is is there a better way coming or have you thought about this issue yet? Uh, well, well, so, so the, the answer, answer is it's, it's thought, thought about. Uh, it's, it's, it's really down, down to the implementations, implementations and not down, down to the design of XForms uh, uh, because, because uh, as, as far as I know, there's nothing stopping uh, using, using different, different uh, uh, schema, schema languages. Um, so, um, uh, I, I should, should say, say uh, put, put pressure, pressure on the implementers, implementers if uh, if, uh, if if that's, that's what, what you're if that's what you need. Okay, that's that's. Uh, I wanted to hear that uh, directly from you because, in fact, I am working with Elaine right now. Um, we're currently in the midst of discussing and possibly prototyping uh, some uh, Schematron accommodations with an XSLT forms for the future. So, uh, but. The, Thank you for that question. I mean, for that uh, response. All right. All right. Shall we have, we have lunch? lunch? Thank, Thank you, you all. all. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.